Good afternoon, serious students of World War II. Mr. O'Brien, unit review. The war in North Africa. This is going to be a different type of war, men, where temperatures in daytime can reach 115, 120 degrees, freezing at night, sandstorms of 30,000 feet, where water is always a critical supply, food never guaranteed, and a war and environment that we've never fought in before. And the British will lead the way. Let's begin. The war in North Africa, 1940 to 1943. You can, sir, you can see the medallion of those who served in North Africa, known as the Desert Rats. And that is a term of endearment, mostly that refers to the armored divisions that fought with Field Marshal Montgomery and the British against Erwin Rommel and the Africa Corps. All right, let's begin. So, gentlemen, as you know, the Italians had this dream under Mussolini of bringing back Julius Caesar's empire. And that empire consisted of controlling everything that touched the Mediterranean and some countries beyond. We've also learned that in the early and mid-1930s that Mussolini tried his luck against countries like Ethiopia and Somaliland and little countries like this. And he had mixed reviews, but he did dominate these poor, shall we say, traditional countries of Africa. Well, this time he bit off a little bit more than he could chew, because as he begins to attack the areas near Egypt and Libya, the British realize something, that if the British lose the seaport of Alexandria and the Suez Canal, that their entire operations in the Mediterranean will be endangered. You see, they already control the Rock of Gibraltar, between Spanish Morocco and Spain. They control the island of Malta, which is critical for supplying the British Eighth Army in Africa, and they own the Suez Canal. So any threat to this would be a strategic threat and must be stopped in its tracks. So the Italians go in there and they believe they have the, the, the plans and the wherewithal to handle the British, but they don't. As soon as they get in there, they realize that the British are professionals. There were stories of entire Italian divisions throwing up their hands in defeat without even firing their rifles to under-numbered British soldiers. It was always talked about, and there was a lot of jokes about, did the Italians really have the fighting spirit? Well, of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but the Italian leadership seemed to be in a lot of conflict and the Italians just couldn't bring it to the forefront in Africa and they were in deep trouble. And so Mussolini does what Mussolini loves to do. He goes and visits Hitler and he petitions Hitler to rescue him. He also lays out for Hitler the chance to take the Suez Canal and even more importantly, push on to the oil fields of the Middle East. Now that's intriguing, but there's an issue. Maybe Mussolini knows this, maybe he doesn't. Hitler is planning to betray his ally Russia and invade in the spring of 1941, Operation Barbarossa. The last thing he needs is another campaign in North Africa. Now if that campaign can be quick and concise, then maybe perhaps I can come to your rescue. And Hitler does exactly that. But in the meantime, the British are going to rub the Italians. And this particular photograph is the very professional soldier by the name of General Archibald Wavell. And Wavell in December 1940 is going to have a two-pronged attack against the Italians, which is going to be so, shall we say, instrumentally, strategically sound. This man's a really good soldier. The, the, the Italians can't get out of the way of themselves. In the route, they literally lose 130,000 Italian prisoners, and they lose over 5,000 miles in territories. And the British casualties are 500. Men, that's one of the worst defeats in the history of World War II, especially for the Italians. That ranks right up there with Singapore, and it ranks right up there with Tobruk. So the British 
are in no danger of losing their strategic location in North Africa. They feel pretty good about themselves. But then, as things start to look really good, and Emperor Haile Selassie, the Lion of Ethiopia, who was driven out by Mussolini in 1936, is returned to power courtesy of the British, that's when things begin to get a little bit, shall we say, hazy. Because we're getting reports, British intelligence is getting reports, that a new army has been created. A new army of German troopers and tankers, and also going to bring in the Luftwaffe, known as the Africa Corps. Now in German, Africa is spelled with a K, and Corps is spelled with a K, and not a C. But looking at this picture in the insert, we can see that the Italians are going to need all the help they can get. Well, the gentleman they bring in for this particular uh, adventure is going to be a gentleman by the name of Erwin Rommel. But before Rommel can get there, the British are distracted. You see, the Italians are at it again. Against Hitler's wishes, Mussolini not only invaded Egypt, he also invaded Greece. And once again, the Italians ability to fight is much less than their ability to comprehend logistics. You just can't send armies all around the world if you don't have the proper logistical supplies to feed them, give them weapons, medical supplies, and the Italians find themselves once again on the wrong end of a bad deal in Greece. And as the Greeks rise up, even civilians, as we see in this picture here, of the Antartico, which is the underground, Mussolini finds himself once again asking for Hitler's help. And of course, Hitler being a good friend, oh my gosh, the Axis powers probably would have done so much better without Italy, comes to the occasion and is going to help the Italians in Greece. He's going to help them in Africa and he's helping them in Greece. But what they don't realize is that every time you delay the operation for Russia, the Russian winter has a habit of coming very early. And in 1941, the Russian winter came in September. We're still fighting hurricanes in September. And if Hitler had not been tied down in Africa, and Hitler had not been tied down in Greece, his chances of taking Moscow in 1941 and Leningrad and do I dare even say? No, I'm not going to say it. I will say it. Stalingrad would have greatly improved. But these distractions are going to cause him to delay his launch until June 22nd, 1941, which was just too late. But anyway, let's get back to Africa, shall we? All right. Now, the Desert Fox. Gentlemen, the Desert Fox, the brilliant General Erwin Rommel heavily decorated soldier from the Italian front in World War I when Italy was against Germany, at one time was a head of the SS bodyguards for Adolf Hitler's personal security, wrote books on warfare, especially tactics for infantry, which the fiery George S. Patton of the U.S. Army read before he went into battle against Rommel in Morocco during Operation torch was also known as the brilliant commander during the, the war for France in 1940. In fact, during the Battle of France, he was called the commander of the Ghost Division because they were traveling so fast, their tanks, that their infantry and fuel trucks couldn't even find them. He was a brilliant tactician who did everything right, often told Hitler he would follow his orders to the letter and then did use his own intuition. But how do you fire a guy who keeps winning? In fact, when he gets to North Africa, before he can even get fully organized, he goes on the attack against the British. Now, the British, and they don't like it, but they have to. They call him the Desert Fox. The Desert Fox, because he's that clever. It is a begrudging compliment. And the Desert Rats will be up against the Desert Fox. Now, even though Hitler did not want to be in Africa... If Rommel could take the Suez Canal, it would literally cause the entire dynamic of World War II to change. So Hitler's going to throw the dice on this one. 
and he's got the right man for the job. Okay. Now, if you can control Tobruk, you control Libya. Hmm. Now, gentlemen, Rommel's counterattacks are just absolutely textbook perfect. They're absolutely textbook perfect. Right? When he comes into Africa, and he comes into Libya, and he's going to be able to drive along the coastline at a propensus rate. It doesn't seem like his men ever get tired. They never seem to have critical fuel shortages. They're always in the fight. Sandstorms can't stop them. Minefields can't stop them. As we look here, the SAS, the Special Air Service, commandos in jeeps that harass their airfields and their supply lines at night can't stop them, and including Operation Battle Axe. Now, you men, there's a place along the coast in Libya called Tobruk. It is an ancient fortress. And if you control Tobruk, you control Libya. And Rommel's, one of his greatest victories is when he's finally going to be able to take Tobruk. And he's going to pay a high price for it. And if you control Tobruk, you control Libya. And if you control Libya, you control almost all of North Africa. So Operation Battle Axe was an effort to dislodge Rommel. Right? And you know, it's not going to be that successful. It seems that the mystique of Rommel is getting bigger and better all the time. Now the funny thing here, men, is that the British have already broken the German codes. We know that, right? Sometimes we call it ultra, sometimes we call it magic. And even though we're reading Rommel's mail, Rommel seems to be able to outfox the best of the British commanders. In fact, the big problem, men, sometimes is not the battlefield, it's the Mediterranean, where the supplies are being torpedoed by Italian and German submarines and what they call E-boats, which are torpedo boats. And this is going to be a war of logistics, all right? And when the English lose the Ark Royal, they know that this is not going to be a walk in the park against the Africa Corps and trying to control the Mediterranean North Africa, all right? Uh, we now have a new general here by the name of General Auchinleck. He's going to launch Operation Crusade. And finally, he's going to be able to dislodge Rommel a little bit, right? He's going to be able to push him out and take him back to where he started his campaign. So if one word to talk about the North Africa campaign, that one phrase or one word would be seesaw battle. Back and forth, back and forth with nobody holding territory ultimately that long. And as you can see from here, we had the Italian campaign, and then Commander Wavell, the British, came in and pushed him back, and then Rommel came out with an early end run and pushed the English all the way back to the, the uh, Katara Depression, which is one, of one gigantic, dusty, quicksand, nasty place. Akaluk takes him back out of Tobruk, Rommel counterattacks and makes it within, just within 65 miles of Alexandria. Now, men, he wasn't down here in Sub-Saharan Africa. They were actually along the coastline. Here's Tobruk, right? And, men, if you have Alexandria, you have one of the most important seaports in North Africa, and you're only 65 miles to the Suez Canal. That's like from Columbus to, like, you know, North Palm Beach, Right. He almost does it. The seesaw battle goes back and forth. Men, if Rommel could have taken the seaport of Alexandria and the Suez Canal and the oil fields, oh, I can't imagine that World War II would end in 1945. I think Hitler would have had the upper hand for some time. Look at this picture, men. It's actually Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill flies... A very imperilous to do this, right? The Luftwaffe, the RAF doesn't completely control the skies of the Mediterranean. For President, for, uh, pardon me, for Churchill to fly in to visit the British troops was a high risk. But you know, quite frankly, quite frankly, that's the kind of guy Churchill was. He really was. Now, Rommel is the kind of guy that's on the mat. He never, ever, ever gives up. And when he counterattacks to retake Tobruk, he is greatly outnumbered by the British Army. But using trickery, 
he's able to make the British think that the Africa Corps is much larger and Tobruk this time falls for permanently. Oh, 1942 is not starting off very well, especially when there's 30,000 tons of equipment, ammunition, guns, tanks, food. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean the Germans use British tanks? Yes. And the British would use German equipment. They've just pinned a new insignia over it. But isn't that kind of dangerous? You know, mistaken identity? It did happen. But in war, as in love, they tell me, all is fair. So Hitler was, was absolutely feeling really good about Africa, and Churchill was in a, let's use the word, funk. He thought that the loss of Tobruk was as disgraceful as the loss of the gigantic fortress of Singapore and the Far East by the Japanese not long after Pearl Harbor. It was a dark day. And so he's going to clean house. He's going to get rid of a lot of commanders, right? And he's actually going to beg President uh, Roosevelt for the new Sherman tanks that are coming out of the United States. And there it is, man. That's the Sherman tank. And that Sherman tank is a pretty good tank against the little German Panzers, you know, the Mark, uh, the Mark 1s and 2s, okay? And so we're going to find out that these tanks, even though they're not equipped for the desert, the Sherman's going to fight in almost every single theater of World War II. So sometimes the hardware can win the day. But more importantly, while he's in Washington talking to President Roosevelt, they come up with an idea for Operation Torch. All right, most important, Operation Torch. Operation Torch was the idea of the Americans coming from the east in Morocco and the British coming from the west, Egypt and Libya, and crushing the Africa Corps in between two of them. Now, men, the Americans have never fought against the Germans before, ever. No, I'm not talking about U-boats and cargo ships in the Atlantic. I'm talking man-to-man. -man. The first time we ever met the Japanese was in a godforsaken island north of Australia, not far from New Guinea, called Guadalcanal. But the first time we're going to meet the Germans and fight them, we're going to fight them in a place pretty close to Morocco called the Khyber Pass, and we're going to learn the hard way that the Germans don't play. In fact, we're going to have a lot to learn about how to fight against these guys because the Germans are the varsity. They've been at it since 1939. So, for a while there, at least there's some good news. The Shermans are starting to show up in the United States, and they're an excellent tank to fight against the Germans at this point. But, men, that will change. All right. 60 miles. There's one of the little Panzer IIs right there. Hey, we talked about this. It's not on the test, but it's good to know. Those are jerry cans. The Germans invented the portable gas cans that we still use today. You know those five-gallon gas drums that you carry around the back of your Jeep on the outside? Hopefully on the outside, right? They're designed a direct copy of the gas tanks that they used on the Africa Corps, right? Because you can never take, you know, you can't take gas for granted. you got to bring your own water and supplies. And we talked about the fact that it was so hot and so many biting flies and sandstorms that everyone in the Africa Corps insisted on wearing full clothing. Well, the British just took their chances. They wore shorts. Crazy, man. I don't know. I think I'll go full equipment because I don't do very well in the sun. Well, but I digress. Okay. So there's a new player coming in here. So General Harold Arnold was actually one of the guys that helped the British Army, the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force escaped from Dunkirk. But you know, Churchill doesn't like the ideas of talking about escape and, and, you know, and withdrawals and uh, that kind of stuff. No, we don't want to talk about withdrawing the British Army out of Africa like we did the BEF and Dunkirk in France. But the land operation is going to be handed over to a guy by the name of General Bernard Law Monty Montgomery. He's not my favorite British commander. Later, we're going to see him in a disastrous airborne invasion in Holland uh, called Operation Market Garden. But right now, in Africa, 
he seems to have the impetus to pull the desert rats together and to stop Rommel's wild ride of victory. So Monty's going to be with us now from 1942 until the end of the war. In fact, he'll become the most dominant of the British Army generals, and he will not get along with an American commander in North Africa by the name of General George S. Patton. In fact, Patton and Montgomery hated each other, and they'll prove that when we get to Sicily. All right. British intelligence, I, I got to put this on the test. British intelligence wins the day again. Men, Rommel was plagued by the idea that all his secret codes and messages were being compromised. It just seemed the British knew everything. And when you are have some, have some thirsty tanks and men without food, and you watch your cargo ships get torpedoed before they come into the German seaports in North Africa, it's a very sinking feeling. Oh, okay, that was a bad one. It's a very bad feeling. And so British intelligence does not get enough credit during the Battle of Britain against the Luftwaffe. British intelligence does not get enough credit in the defeat of the Africa Corps and the Italians. And quite frankly, they deserve more. And here's proof positive. When you lose three fuel ships, men, that means your tanks aren't going to be moving very far in the future. You cut a man's supply lines, you cut his army. All right. So Montgomery takes the offensive. And with the information he knows, he's able to meet Rommel on the gates of Alexandria, practically, right here at a little village called El Alamein. It's kind of like a, it's not a very big town at all. As a matter of fact, people still go there because there's World War II relics everywhere. I wouldn't do that myself because, believe it or not, there are still active landmines out there, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of landmines that have never been detected. And they were made so good that some of them are still effective and they still can fire. Well, men, here's the thing. Rommel's been fighting illness. He's fatigued. He's exhausted. Living in a tent in the desert is not easy for him. He is often under the weather, right? But he's not the kind of guy that complains. And it's becoming very evident to his men that he is just worn out. And so, quite frankly, right, they're going to replace him. Going to bring him back to Germany, you know, let him rest a little bit. And they're going to put in a great leader to take his place, right? Well, no one can match Rommel. We know that. A guy by the name of General George Stumm. But George Stumm couldn't take the stress of combat and died very suddenly right before the Battle of El El Alamein. So Rommel's hospital visit and relaxation is cut short, and he's on his way back for the two battles of El Alamein. But men, through British deception and superior artillery, And the fact that the Germans did not have enough gasoline and bullets and Hitler's beginning to hoard equipment and men for the Russian campaign is going to cost El Alamein and Rommel the Suez Canal. He's finally going to be stopped. It's considered to be one of the pivotal battles, if not the most pivotal battle of the African campaign. I wish we had more time to talk about it, but it was a stroke of genius. But then again... British intelligence had told Montgomery everything about Rommel and Strum's battle plans. All right. It's the beginning of the end. Man, when we say, you know, the British, we have to remember something, man. The British were multinational. They had South Africans, New Zealanders, Australian, uh, people from Australia, right? Uh, They had like almost seven different countries fighting with them. Yes, it's true that, you know, the Germans still had the Italians, but I think that's enough this we can say about the Italians. I have really not a whole lot of military respect for the size of the fight in the Italian dog. But that's let's just move on. Okay, so unfortunately, Rommel's going to now have it go into a 2,000-mile retreat, and he's going to never get the impetus to return to fight the British like he did earlier in 41. Now, men, there's something else. Operation Torch is now beginning. When Rommel's at his low point after El Alamein, news comes that there has been a gigantic amphibious invasion. 
In fact, up until Normandy, it'll be the biggest amphibious invasion in, in, in history. Yes. I mean, we're talking massive British Navy, uh, American Navy attacking in three places, starting in Morocco and ending up in Tunisia, right? And But there's an issue. Do you remember when Hitler took uh, France in less than eight weeks? In fact, it was much less than eight weeks. It was like six weeks, right? And do you remember how the southern French decided they didn't want to fight the Nazis and they said they would cooperate? And they were called in the Vichy French because they signed a peace treaty, the French and the Germans, in a city called Vichy? Well, guess what? Those German-loving Frenchmen control Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia. And we don't know if the French will fight against this for the Germans. And this picture right here is Admiral Jean-Francois Darlan. Now, nobody, man, this was, God, man, nobody liked this guy because he used to be a, a two-timer. All right? He would tell Hitler whatever he wanted to hear. And when the Americans approached him about maybe switching sides, right, he would play both ends against the middle. We never, never really truly trusted him. And then when he saw the British and American soldiers coming across in West North Africa and Morocco, he switched sides. Now, we didn't know whether or not he was good, we could trust him. But it didn't matter because in just a few days, three days to be exact, Algeria and Morocco fell. And the question of whether we could trust Darlin or not didn't matter because he was murdered by an assassin on December 24th, 1942. Men, you could spend an hour talking about the intrigue and the James Bond escapades about the death of this French Vichy leader. Now listen to me very carefully, men. This is a test question. Hitler was so upset about Morocco and Algeria and the French betraying him that he ordered his army to immediately attack southern France, and they did. They occupied it. So the promise not to invade the rest of France went out the window. Hitler gets his revenge. The Americans come ashore, and even though the Americans come ashore, there are a number of French fighters who aren't going to obey the ceasefire order, who will not betray the Germans. And the Vichy French, some of them fight on, and they cause a problem for the Americans, right? It's going to be a problem. Uh, here's a photograph here. This is interesting, okay, because the French had a very large fleet. Right here, here's Mirza Kabir, right? And thank goodness those battleships and destroyers and cruisers did not end up with the Craig Marine or the German Navy, and luckily they scuttled them. Yes, the French destroyed 58 warships before the Nazis could get them. This is good news for the Allies. And you can see the picture here of one of their big battleships burning, destroyed by their own hands. Hitler does not have a good night when he hears this, right? He does not have a good night at all. The fleet at Mirs el Kabar has been destroyed. The rest of the fleet at Toulon, which was the big battleships, has been destroyed. And they do not come into German hands. Well, what's the big deal? If that French fleet could have stopped the British ships, right? Because Hitler was planning on boycotting or putting a blockade around Malta. Because, you see, the Italians could sneak supplies into North Africa through Italy, through Sicily, into Tunisia. And if the British have Malta, they can torpedo the cargo ships. So the French fleet under the Germans could have stopped and made sure that Malta was captured. So the supplies coming to Rommel would never be interrupted. And remember, even though Spain likes the Germans, and they have since 36 in the Civil War, they're neutral. So this is a huge blow to lose the French fleet, all right? And there's a picture right there of a V, that's an American aircraft we gave to the French, right? And you can see it's got French markings on attacking British torpedo airplanes. So don't think that all the Vichy gave up without a fight. Some of them stayed with the Germans, okay? All right. Yeah, but at least them, at least them, you know, most of them did lay down their weapons for us or else we would have had a a much harder time in North Africa.
But man, you know, maybe I should need to underscore this. Because of the time and the resistance we had against the Germans and the Vichy French, the war planners began to realize that we're not going to have that cross-channel invasion into Normandy or anywhere else in France anytime soon. And that the operation is going to have to be postponed until 1944. And Stalin's been begging for us to open up a second front to help him because the war in Russia has begun. And quite frankly, there's going to be repercussions. We're not ready to fight the Germans. We had superior weaponry and superior men. But you know what? The Germans fought like, I mean, they fought like tigers. So America is not quite ready for this yet. We're going to have to learn how to fight the Germans a little bit better. And George Patton is going to be in charge of that. And trust me, he will lose sleep on how to make the U.S. Army a better army because we got embarrassed by the Germans in uh, a place called the Khyber Pass. All right. And we'll go on to the next one here. And there's Fortress Malta we talked about. Operation Pedestal. Good gosh, man, this operation was so big that the that President Roosevelt even promised the USS Wasp, yes, to help try to break the siege of Malta, because the Germans want to take it from the British so bad. Men, and we remember from the video the number of British ships that were lost, including aircraft carriers, the German submarines and Italian submarines. What a costly, costly fight. But in the end of the day, Malta is still Britain, and that means the supply lines from Italy to the Africa Corps will be impeded, and that's a victory for the Allies, all right? Whoops, and then slowly we begin to learn something, men, that even though we paid a terrible price for North Africa, the easy victories for Germany and Italy are starting to disappear, yes. We're starting little by little to see the turn tide against the Germans. We're actually starting to think that this is not the end of the beginning, but maybe just maybe the beginning of the end. We're starting to see a little bit of glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. And so maybe just perhaps we can defeat the Germans in a timely fashion. And as you know, the Italians, they'll be done by 1943, the first of the Axis to give up. All right, we did a couple of review questions there. And then we had a surprise. Right when we felt pretty good about the Sherman tanks, the Germans introduced the Tiger Mark VI. I wrote down Mark I, that's a typo, the Mark VI. Arguably, when we ran across this tank with our Shermans at uh, Bezert, Tunisia, oh my God, the Tigers just made, they went through the Shermans like pinatas. In fact, the Germans will call the Shermans the Zippo lighter. Like the famous American lighter, it flames up er every time you strike it. And the Tiger will be arguably, arguably, now I know a lot of guys out there study World War II, arguably the best tank of World War II. But that debate continues, right? In fact, the British were so upset about the Tigers and other tanks, they start putting 40 millimeter cannons on their hurricanes. Wow. And then that wraps it up, the campaign in North Africa. Uh, remember the key players. you got General Montgomery, Erwin Rommel, all right? But really, really important is that you remember Operation Torch, why Malta was important, what exactly the Vichy French were, and how they cooperated or did not cooperate with the Allies. And if you can, all right, try to remember why the Suez Canal was so strategic to not only Britain, but the Allies as a whole. Okay, this is OB signing off. Hoping you have a really good afternoon. Looking forward to seeing you in class very soon. All right.